uh, all the speakers could you please put your um, put your yeah. yeah the ones who have joined please put yourself on mute i'm here on a very good evening everyone welcome to i focus online lecture 234 number 21 in our series from squint and pediatric ophthalmology today is a master class by professor vinita singh from lucknow ma'am is a renowned and beloved teacher and she'll be teaching us uh, about a and v patterns the etiology clinical findings diagnosis and management i invite professor pradeep sharma sir to welcome her and in, uh, introduce her to our audience thank you rolika it's a real great pleasure to introduce dr professor vinita singh who has been a stalwart in strabismus uh, since a long time you would say she did her mbbs and ms from king george medical university 35 years in kgmu and then as a faculty and head of department of the ophthalmology she is currently the academic director of institute of ophthalmology sitapur and consultant vivekanand polyclinic and institute of medical sciences lucknow she has served as professor and head of ophthalmology department of BPK IHS Dharan uh, in Nepal she has been a pro visiting professor in U University of New Mexico USA and University of Colorado USA she did uh, had a uh, phyco in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus she has received basic and advanced training in medical education in uh, advanced course from uh, uh, FIME she has done a lot of work major scientific work on strabismus pediatric vision and cataract surgery and has established a pediatric vision care clinic at KGMU uh ma'am is really a great stalwart and we it will be a pleasure listening to her on the management of a and b patterns so she has also done a lot of work with inclen past academic and administrative positions as secretary and uh, presently uh, still recently she was the president of all india strabismus society passionate about academics training and teaching young ophthalmologists she has published several papers in peer reviewed national and international journals and contributed several book chapters so over to dr vinita singh uh, please thank you dr pradeep for so many nice words i don't know how which how what a small percentage of that i really deserve anyway thank you so much so without wasting time we proceed with the talk for today and today we have chosen to speak on uh, pattern deviations let me just begin the screen sharing thing yes ma'am it's fine Okay, so pattern deviations uh, i try to i'll try to be brief at places because i presume that the very basics i is not the, does not come under the scope of this lecture so pattern deviations are described by alphabets and they denote a difference in the magnitude of horizontal deviation in up a difference in the magnitude of horizontal deviation in up and down gaze the the prevalence has been described as 12 to 50% in strabismus patients and uh, uh, the a and v patterns are the common ones <clears throat> there are other variants also and their recognition is clinically important <clears throat> a pattern describes a horizontal deviation that is more convergent in the up gaze is my cursor visible hello Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is. Ah, it is. So, it is a pattern describes a deviation which is more convergent in the up gaze, and uh, a V pattern describes a pattern which is more divergent in the up gaze. So that is like this alphabet, and uh, because of the slight physiological divergence in up gaze, the significant uh, uh, amount of deviation. difference for v pattern is taken as 15 prism diopters and for a pattern it is taken as 10 prism diopters so here you see a, a pattern exotropia this is an a pattern isotropia and same way this is v pattern exotropia and v pattern isotropia v pattern is more common than a pattern although certain western studies 
talk about a pattern being more common, but I also feel, and in Indian studies, we have found V pattern to be more common. It is usually associated with inferior oblique overaction and very frequently associated with infantile esotropia. And it may occur in patients with superior oblique palsy, particularly if there is a bilateral palsy. And other than that, craniofacial malformations may sometimes present with V patterns. A pattern is the second most common. It is usually associated with superior oblique overaction and occurs most frequently in patients with exotropia. And A pattern is more common than V pattern in patients with infantile estrabismus associated with craniofacial anomalies. <clears throat> These are pictures of the same thing which we had shown you diagrammatically. This is showing a esotropia, which is much more in down gaze than in up gaze. This is a V pattern. And this is showing a esotropia, which is much more in up gaze than in down gaze. This is A pattern, esotropia. These, these are pictures of exotropia. This is V pattern. See, the exo in up gaze is much more than in down gaze. And this is A pattern exotropia. We'll talk in a little more in talk in a little more detail subsequently. There are other patterns which have been described. Uh, y pattern, which is supposed to be a subtype of V pattern, arrow pattern, lambda pattern, it is supposed to be a subtype of A pattern. X pattern, it, it shows X pattern as the name suggests, there is relative divergence both in up gaze and down gaze. And it is <coughs> usually associated with tight lateral recti. And sometimes overaction of both the obliques has been associated with this. There is a diamond pattern that has been described, but as I said, the V and A patterns are the most common. These are some pictures. You can see this, I need not describe. This is an X pattern. This is a lambda pattern. And this is a Y pattern where the deviation in the primary gaze and down gaze are same, almost same. And there is divergence in the up gaze. <clears throat> now, clinically, it is important to recognize these patterns because <laughs> we need to modify our surgical procedure, more so if the deviation in primary gaze is 60 PD or lesser. And sometimes in very large horizontal deviations, it is difficult to identify or quantify the pattern. And then we may have to plan two stage surgery knowingly. The cyclovertical muscle overactions sometimes tend to disappear after a very large horizontal deviation has been corrected. So this is where our decision and the detailed clinical examination comes into uh, need. And missed pattern deviations and missed cyclovertical muscle dysfunctions may result in unsatisfactory outcomes of horizontal muscle surgery. So we, we know that the horizontal estrabismus, all of us are seeing every day almost, and uh, the pattern deviations are so common. So naturally, it goes that we have to look for them. But before we really go into looking into them, uh, uh, how to look for them, let us have a brief, this thing about the etiology. There have been various theories that have been uh, suggested in the past. And uh, we have very senior ophthalmologists with us here, and we have all gone through all these theories in the past. But lately, the extra extraocular muscle pulleys have come into recognition with the advent of MRIs. And oblique muscle dysfunction, the one of the very old theories, still stays with us. The other horizontal muscle dysfunction and vertical muscle dysfunctions are, have not been really proved. And there are uh, theories which suggest some abnormalities in the central neuromuscular pathways. Out of this, prolonged loss of fusion and torsion anomalies is there. The other are not so common. The oblique muscle dysfunction is the most accepted and commonly encountered mechanism. We often describe them as over elevation in adduction for inferior oblique overaction and over 
depression in adduction for superior oblique overaction. Inferior oblique overaction causes a relative divergence in up cares, that is the V pattern, and superior oblique overaction causes a relative divergence in down gaze, that is the A pattern. <clears throat> You can notice here, this is an esotropia, much more in down gaze than in up gaze. So this is V pattern. And you can notice the inferior oblique overaction here. <coughs> Same, similar picture, an older one. You see the inferior oblique overaction with V pattern esotropia. This is a V exo with Inferior oblique overaction, but here it is not as much as in the earlier earlier patterns, earlier slides. This is a a pattern exotropia associated with superior oblique overaction. <clears throat> you notice the mark exo here as compared to up gaze and in primary gaze. <clears throat> this is an exo a. Again, you see. Much less divergence here, more divergence here, and the overaction of the superior oblique, which is more visible here. <clears throat> this is showing an ESO A. This is this slide is showing a lambda pattern, which is a variation of A pattern. Again, here we see the superior oblique overaction. The horizontal and the vertical muscle dysfunction theories are less accepted. And just, just a brief this thing, I will say that the medial rectus is more active in down gaze. So medial rectus weakness or under action results in a A pattern exotropia and medial rectus over action results in a V pattern esotropia. Same way, lateral rectus under action, lateral rectus is more active in up gaze. So under action results in an A pattern esotropia and over action results in a V pattern exotropia. The superior recti, when they are underacting, they give rise to a V pattern. And if the inferior recti are underacting, they give rise to an A pattern. And I said, as I said earlier, this, this theory is not, has not become, is, is less accepted. And we usually find the oblique muscles to be at fault. Now, the pulley dysfunction has been proved by MRI studies and uh, the abnormalities of the pulleys we have been able to identify with MRIs. And uh, this, has, this is gaining popularity. And I think this will also define our future action. So these pulleys, they comprise of the posterior condensation of the tenons capsule, along with components of elastin, collagen, and smooth muscles. See here? These are the superior rectus, lateral rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and condensation of the collagen, fibrin, and connective tissue, they form the pulleys. And they, in a way, alter the, the effective origin of the muscle for the function, for the functional part of it. The, the anomalies of muscle pulleys can result in slippage of the muscle during globe rotations and call, cause various patterns in the deviations. The, what happens if there is a pulley heterotopy? Even small mislocations of muscle pulleys, especially if they are perpendicular to the plane of the muscle. For example, vertical displacement of horizontal rectus can cause vertical infirmities. An inferior mislocation of lateral rectus pulley can resemble an inferior oblique overaction and generate a V pattern a superior displacement of lateral rectus pulley can resemble a superior oblique overaction manifesting as an A pattern. Just a diagrammatic representation of the pulley effect. See, if the, <coughs> if the lateral rectus, see, this is the lateral rectus, this is the medial rectus. If the lateral rectus is rotated down, uh, if the pulley is displaced down, then it causes a V pattern deviation resembling a inferior oblique overaction. And if the lateral rectus pulley is shifted up, 
it causes a a pattern uh, a pattern deviation resembling a superior oblique overaction now these are some uh, a little more complicated but uh, i just wanted to highlight this that the M mris have shown the displacements of the muscles and they have also shown a difference in the posterior partial volume of the lateral recti and medial recti and their ratios so these are concepts which are coming up and we all know that not many centers are able to do these mris high resolution mris but i think this is the future for studying the muscles in more detail orbital anomalies as in craniofacial abnormalities palpebral fissure abnormalities hydrocephalus paleo plagiocephaly cruzen apers and various uh, uh, craniofacial abnormalities they cause misdirected muscle forces by change in relative position of the trochlea that may lead to sagittalization or desagittalization of the superior oblique and they may also change the direction of the muscle pulleys causing pseudo overactions and underactions of the oblique muscles sagittalization means anterior positioning of the trochlea which makes the oblique muscle more parallel to the antero posterior plane and desagittalization means posterior displacement of the trochlea which makes the oblique muscle more parallel to the coronal plane and therefore the direction becomes the action becomes altered so retroplacement of the trochlea causes desagittalization and a pseudo paresis of the superior oblique which may result in an overaction of the inferior oblique which presents as a v pattern and in hydrocephalus when there is frontal blossing the trochlea is displaced forwards and this may result in a overacting superior oblique and present as e pain a pattern so these are the ct images of a patient of plagiocephaly and showing the shift of the trochlea the central factors have been described though they are as of today less accepted but the loss of fusion theory is the most accepted then there are supranuclear anomalies and vestibular anomalies have been reported uh, in some patients let us see the effect of prolonged torsional drift so when there is a prolonged loss of fusion there is a torsional drift and the eyeballs tend to be in extrovert uh, extortion and that results in a v pattern kind of a presentation because it allows the superior rectus to overact in up gaze and the inferior rectus to overact in down gaze like here and same way the medial rectus acts as a partial elevator and lateral rectus acts as a partial depressor if there is prolonged extorsional drift uh, in patients where there is loss of fusion for a long time now as far as the clinical presentation is concerned there is of course a complaint of ocular deviation some patients com may complain of intermittent transient diplopia there may be asthenopic symptoms and sometimes there is compensatory head posture when the patient is able to have a, a, a minimal deviation or no deviation in a particular gaze but these are not the presenting features we have to actually look for them and become aware if we find these symptoms in a patient with concomitant deviation so ocular alignment is better in down gaze in a pattern esotropia and v pattern exotropia there therefore we find a chin up posture and it is better in up gaze in v pattern esotropia and a pattern exotropia and hence there is a chin down position now this is something which i want to point out how not to miss because we often see that we get a patient our pgs get a patient they do a cover test and they tell us their findings so if there is a concomitant squint and there is even a slightest hint of a compensatory head posture 
we must of course become a little more aware but other than that this is what i emphasize that we must make it a habit to do the cover test in all cases and if we find a discrepancy we must go ahead to measure this by the prism bar cover test and while testing the versions it is not enough only to look for the motility limitations but we must make a careful note of the overactions of the upshoots and downshoots so over elevation in adduction or over depression in adduction they can tell us about the oblique muscle overactions or dysfunctions and this is how we grade them as from plus 1 to plus 4 <clears throat> to actually quantify the uh, difference in the deviation in up gaze and down gaze i rely more on the pbct but you could also measure on the sonoprofore and we measure at 33 cm fixation distance with a full refractive correction in 25 degrees elevation and 35 degrees depression sometimes the pattern is not obvious at a near working distance in that in that situation we do it for a distance target and we have to then ask the patient do the cover test when the chin up and chin down position we must if we are suspecting oblique overactions we must not forget to look for intorsions and extorsions this is showing intorsion in a patient with superior oblique overaction notice that the fovea should have been somewhere here same way here and we sometimes we see when we are suspecting an oblique muscle dysfunction and we are not getting clear cut over actions and under actions and we are still suspecting it then the ocular tor torsion may become a more reliable observation <coughs> we get x cyclo torsion in inferior oblique over action and in cyclo torsion in superior oblique over action the this i have already says that when necessary we have to measure uh, we we may have to measure in all nine gazes but when we are suspecting a a or v pattern it is very important to measure at least in up gaze primary gaze and down gaze we must also make an attempt to assess as to how this up shoot and down shoot is behaving after we have neutralized the larger horizontal deviation and orbital imaging as i have told you with the recent advent of mris and uh, even higher versions of mris we are able to identify the muscle pulleys and dynamic mris can also be done so of course not many of us have lot of experience with these but we have seen some of these mris and some of these differences and as you all know there are limitations sometimes the patients are unable to get it done sometimes the centers do not have the facility but anyway wherever possible these could be helpful <clears throat> now once we have diagnosed we have to think about the surgical approach and whenever we talk of surgical approach in squint even if it is a simple horizontal squint you know sometimes we we often like to be keep our fingers crossed and we we have to decide what to do how much to do and same is true here but still there are certain principles which guide us and we must follow them so in order of preference this is the surgical approach oblique muscle weakening along with horizontal muscle surgery for horizontal deviation in primary gaze if there is over elevation or over depression in adduction right if over elevation or over depression in adduction is not present then we can go for full tendon up or down displacement of the horizontal recti we may resort to slanting resection or bias resection of the horizontal recti if the pattern deviations are minimal and we are not wanting to do the up shifts or down shifts vertical recti surgery with horizontal displacement of insertions has been advocated but it is not commonly practiced there are various procedures for weakening of the inferior oblique this is not the topic for today but just two things i would like to say mostly we use these two points the shear park's point and the fink point 
One is in relation to the lateral rectus, the other is in relation to the inferior rectus insertion. And sometimes when there is marked inferior oblique overaction, we may resort to anteriorization, although this also has a little bit of anteriorization. A bilateral inferior oblique recession collapses the V pattern by 15 to 25 prism diopters. This is, these are just some pictures showing, this is the inferior rectus insertion and this is where the inferior oblique has gone. The superior oblique weakening procedures, again, there are many and the posterior tenotomy and the splint lengthening procedures are the ones which I like to do. Silicon band expanders, I don't like. Free tenotomy and Z tenotomy. Z tenotomy also we don't do, I don't do for superior oblique. So the first two are the choices for if I have to do a superior oblique weakening procedure. Now talking of the shifts of the horizontal muscles, ye to humare sab PGs ko bhoat achhi tarah yaad hai. Medial rectus towards the apex and lateral rectus towards the base. And we re remember it with the acronym of MAIL. So medial rectus towards the apex and lateral rectus towards the open end. Now, just a little word, half tendon or up, up or down displacement reduces the pattern, uh, is done for patterns which are less than 20 PD and full tendon up or down displacement are done for patterns when they are more than 20 PD. Unilateral r, &R surgery with shifts of lateral rectus and medial rectus of the same eye together, they are likely to induce torsion and they are hence not preferred. But bimedial recession and bilateral recession with up or down displacement does not induce torsion and is the preferred surgery after the oblique surgeries. These are just small pictures because the surgery was not the main aim today. So these are the, this is a recession with up displacement. See the original insertion is here. This has been up displaced and this is showing a slant recession. This is the original insertion. This is, sorry, this is the original insertion and this is the slant. The upper border is stretched far behind than the lower border. This is showing an a isotropia. see, much more here, much less here. And this has been, see, by, this has been dealt with by bimedial recession and up transposition of the medial recti. And you can notice the correction of the isotropia and reduction in the pattern. This is a V. Isotropia, notice the inferior oblique overaction. It is so much marked that even in the primary position, we are getting it. Here, look at this. Look at this. These are the pre-op pictures. And this Without patient, it. these are the post-op pictures. Inferior oblique recession and with r, &R surgery of the right eye. This is an exo V with inferior oblique overaction. This is pre-operative pictures. Again, you see the inferior oblique overaction. And these are the post-op pictures. Bilateral lateral rectus recession with inferior oblique weakening. This is a patient which we were able to follow for a long time. Uh, and this he was treated by bilateral lateral rectus recession uh, with inferior oblique recession. And in the immediate post-operative period, we found almost the absence of the V pattern, but over a long-term follow-up, there was a, the V pattern started showing up. Not to that extent, but still it is there. And the inferior oblique overaction also was much lesser, but some, uh, some, some exo drift and recurrence of V pattern was seen. Now let us do this little exercise. I hope I have an active audience with me. Yes or no? Yes, many have joined. joined. Yeah. Okay. So let us see what we can do here. 
we have a patient of V pattern esotropia with inferior oblique overaction, which will be the surgery of choice. Unilateral inferior oblique weakening with horizontal muscle surgery. Bilateral inferior oblique weakening with horizontal muscle surgery. Unilateral R and R with upshift of lateral rectus and downshift of medial rectus. Bilateral rectus, bilateral, la, bilateral rectus upshift by medial rectus downshift. Anybody would like to try this? A little quiz from ma'am. Dr. Amina, maybe you can. Good evening, ma'am. Yes. Uh, yes ma'am, second evening. option, bilateral eye weakening with horizontal muscle surgery. Yes. I think I would also prefer to do that as first choice. If I don't want to do bilateral IO weakening or maybe a surgeon doesn't want to do IO, then any other option? Dr. Anupha, would you like to answer? Any other option can we do? You see, there are so many options, but we have to choose the best. And sometimes for various reasons, we have to choose the second best. Dr. Nithi, Dr. Shivangi. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, I think yes, option third, unilateral RNR surgery with upshift of uh, LR and downshift of MR. Okay, very good, very good attempt. I, I like residents who don't feel scared in making mistakes. Because as I told you, you see, if I upshift the lateral rectus and downshift the medial rectus of the same eye, it has been reported to, and I also feel, I mean, scientifically also, it is going to give rise to excessive torsion. So this is not the preferred surgery. Under exceptional circumstances, you may do it if the patient is not willing for a bilateral surgery or there are the sometimes you do encounter that. But otherwise, the second shift, second surgery would be this for me. Bimedial rectus recession. You see, we are dealing with B-pattern esotropia. Bimedial rectus recession with downshift. Right? Now, second small, second one, V pattern esotropia. Mind me picture banalo, esotropia, V pattern with no obvious inferior oblique overaction. Nidhi, this time I'm sure you will be correct. Uh, Ma'am, option fifth, a bilateral medial recession with downshift. Yes, that I think should be the first option. Any other? Dr. Komal, Dr. Anubhav, anybody would I like to try? I click quicker. The next option <laughs> would be a bimedial slant recession. And when we do the slant, the slanting is parallel to the pattern that we have. So supposing this is a V pattern esotropia, the upper border of the lateral rectus, of the upper border of the medial rectus will be, will be recessed less and the lower border will be recessed more. So the, the new insertion will be parallel to the pattern that we were doing, right? That we had preoperatively. Now this one, another one, V pattern exotropia with inferior oblique overaction. I'm not reading because I think you all can read it faster than I would speak and you'll get confused if I keep on speaking. V pattern exotropia with inferior oblique overaction. Uh, Ma'am, uh, bilateral IO weakening with horizontal muscle surgery. We can try yes, that. I think that was Amina. Yes, very good. That would be the first surgery of uh, first choice. Next. I think Pradeep is there with us. 
uh, we would like your comments afterwards. Pradeep and Dr. Amitava, both. Um, Ma'am, biomedial vectors downshift can also be done. For, for exotropia surgery, you will have to do medial rectus resection. And resection surgery alone will not be able to correct the exotropia. Right? So I think the fourth should be a better option. Right? Whenever we do a squint surgery, we prefer to do the recession surgery first and then the resection surgery, right? And resection alone does not correct a large deviation. It is re re reserved for very minimal deviations, right, Amina and others? Yes, ma'am. So if there is an exotropia, we would prefer a lateral, bilateral, lateral rectus recession with up or down shift, depending upon the pattern. And if there is an esotropia, then we would prefer a bimedial recession with up or down shift. And that may be further added upon with the resection of the other muscle, depending upon the amount of horizontal deviation, right? So we have here V pattern exotropia with no obvious over elevation on adduction because that is the newer term we use for oblique inferior inferior oblique over action ma'am option e bilateral uh, lateral lateral recession with upshift bilateral that is a that's not a is it um, e. E, e yes e right so that is the first choice and as I said, if recession is not enough to correct the horizontal deviation, an ad 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 additional resection can be added onto it. Any other option you we might do for this? Anybody else would like to try? The second choice, I think, to me, should be the C option. Yes. Wow. I'm correct. Good. <laughs> Believe me, I don't remember. You can't remember all this. It just has to be there. Some logic. So unilateral recess resect surgery with upshift of lateral rectus. That could be the second option, right? Now, I think this is the last one. I made it different so that I also remember. Mm -hmm. A pattern, esotropia with superior oblique overaction. Notice, esotropia, so much more in up gaze, lesser in down gaze. And you notice the oblique overactions, right? I see Nidhi, I see Amina, I think I saw Anupam. From Singapore. Dr. Adarsh, Dr. Anubhav, anybody would like to try? Just try, give it a guess. Ma'am, option C, uh, bilateral esotenotomy. Tenotomy, free tenotomy, though, I don't think uh, we like to do. We like to have the muscle with us even after surgery. We suppose we want to do something else. From option B, bilateral SO desurfing, sir. Yes, that, that is one surgery. And if, if you don't want to do superior oblique surgery or if you are not comfortable with superior oblique surgery, then bilateral the next option is... Session with yes, A. The next option is A. You see, the recession surgery has to be done to correct the esotropia. Superior oblique surgery is not going to correct the esotropia, right? Clear? So you have to do bimedial recession and uh, with post superior oblique, posterior tenotomy of the superior oblique. I think this one and two is a little, uh, this would be um, 
interchangeable. So you could do this or this depending upon your comfort, also depending upon how much superior oblique overaction is there, right? And unilateral superior oblique overaction, usually we don't find, usually we also don't find unilateral inferior oblique overaction. It is sometimes one is more overacting than the other, but once you correct the more overacting, the, lower, the, the other one starts showing as overaction. So I would like to conclude here. Any questions before we conclude? Ma we have we can have questions. questions later on also. Yeah, ma'am, we can have it at the end of the talk. We have a few questions on the chat box and on the social media portals, ma'am. So I would like to conclude by saying that pattern strabismus is relatively common. So whenever you encounter a patient with horizontal deviation, look for a pattern. It may not be there, that is fine. But as we say, the eyes do not see what the mind does not know. So you have to develop your reflexes and look for it. And for that, you, have, you must make it a habit to do the cover test in all gazes. And whenever you find a difference, you measure it, quantify it. And as I said, a good clinical evaluation, I, it is not only in this, but for any, any clinical, uh, any problem, a good clinical evaluation is indispensable to minimize unsatisfactory surgical outcome. So accurate observation and its documentation is the strength of clinical practice. Even if you are not able to explain what you are observing at this time, but those explanations can follow later. But observation and accurate and correct observation and documentation is a habit that all of us must, must, must develop and maintain, no matter how senior you become. And as far as the surgical options are concerned, if there are oblique muscle dysfunctions, then we have to weaken them, tackle them. If, if not, then bimedial or bilateral recession combined with the appropriate up or down shift is done. And other option that is available with us is the slanting uh, recessions and the graded resections. And as I said earlier, that unilateral R&R &R with up displacement uh, uh, or up upshift of one lateral rectus and downshift of the medial rectus of the same eye, or otherwise uh, the uh, down displacement of lateral rectus and up displacement of the medial rectus of the same eye is not the preferred choice. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for that lecture and especially for that little quiz toward the end, which managed to pull our audience and wake them up at nine o'clock, <laughs> which was very much required. Uh, we have a few questions on the chat box, ma'am. Uh, I think I'll take them first. The first one is from Dr. Amina. She is asking, why is there a difference of the amount of deviation, that is 10 prism diopters uh, and 15 prism diopters, between up gaze and down gaze in diagnosing the A and B patterns respectively? That's a very good question, Amina. But uh, I think if you think a little bit, some of you might be able to answer yourselves. But uh, right now, I think it does not give us time for that. Will any, just one person, would any one person like to answer that question? Nidhi? Ma'am, uh, in A pattern, usually there is an esotropia. So, so that's why maybe uh, there's a difference of diopter. <laughs> Okay, good. Good attempt. You see, there is normally, uh, even when there is no pattern, there is a slight amount of physiological divergence in up gaze than in down gaze. Right? So we could think that a little amount of, we won't call it a pattern, of course, but just to explain, a little amount of V pattern is physiological. So that is why that difference that for V pattern, we take 15 prism diopters as significant. And for A pattern, we take 10 prism diopters as significant. Uh, any comments, uh, sir? Amitava, sir, Pradeep, sir? 
Yeah, can you have the whole uh, grid? I mean, we can stop sharing. Stop sharing, okay, stop share. I was going to that physiological thing anyway. Right, good. I think it was a very nice overview on the A and B patterns. And uh, uh, ma'am very nicely tried to explain the different uh, theories or the schools of thought which have been described over the years. Uh, what now we consolidate is that whenever there is an inferior oblique overaction in B patterns and a superior oblique overaction in A patterns, we have to do the weakening of the concerned obliques to correct the A and B patterns. And if there is a significant A or B pattern without the oblique overactions, then only we are doing the horizontal muscle surgeries for, with the upshift or downshift. Uh, we have also seen that the slanting procedures have lesser effect on correcting the A and B patterns. So that is only used as an add-on procedure when we have a larger V or A pattern to tackle. By itself, we do not choose to do a slanting procedure uh, per se. Uh, we usually do, so as I said, if there is an oblique overaction, weaken the obliques. For a V pattern, an inferior oblique needs to be weakened. For an A pattern, if there is a super oblique overaction, which is significant, we need to weaken that. If we do not do that, and we just do the horizontal muscle surgeries, upshift and downshift, we will have problems. Uh, we have seen like that's uh, one of these uh, st uh, studies, which even ma'am had quoted, cited by Haldar, one of our residents, we had seen that we correct the uh, V and A patterns without oblique overactions by the horizontal muscle shifts. We do get a torsion. I mean, this is what has to be seen. Whenever you are doing the horizontal uh, muscles, uh, but whether you do a bilateral recession or you do a unilateral R and R with the upshift and downshift accordingly, you will create a torsion. And that is uh, seen on the fundus, which we had published in that. And I think Dr. Kushner really uh, liked that article and he remarked on it that this is a good observation. That was way back, I think 20 years back, he had said. So there is a torsional shift. Most of the people do not complain because they are having a suppression. Most of these ch children are having concomitant squints, long-standing, and they have a suppression. So they, they do not complain of uh, torsion. Yeah, another but thing, I have uh, seen... Pradeep, just a minute. Another right now, I would also like to say that whenever we are having these pattern deviations and we are not getting obvious oblique muscle over actions, right. we then you do not have to do the oblique. Uh, you, you do not have to do the oblique muscle over actions, but our upshifts and downshifts may be uh, creating torsional effects. So it is yes. a good good habit to look for the torsions preoperatively and document them and then go ahead with the surgery. Correct. So, but what we have seen is that those cases which do not have an oblique overaction, they do not have a preoperative torsion. Yes, they do not have, but it will be good to compare. And it is a confirmatory way of seeing that it is a true inferior or a true superior oblique overaction. And the fundus examination gives us an objective way of assessing the torsion, as we have also talked about in some previous uh, lectures. So I think that is something which I would like to uh, emphasize. And the other thing I would like to emphasize is that people ask how much of horizontal muscle surgery should we do? Uh, for this, it's very clear that the obliques are not uh, doing any uh, change in the uh, deviation in the primary position. Uh, we are talking of oblique muscle surgeries in a controlled manner. When we were doing uh, free tenotomies of superior oblique, like in the uh, past 30, 40 years back, at that time, like Jem Polsky had mentioned, that there may be a 15 prism of ESO shift when you do a bilateral superior oblique tenotomies, which are free. But when we do posterior uh, tenectomy of superior oblique or an inferior oblique weakening, which are controlled procedures, we, do, we do not get any significant change in the horizontal deviation by the oblique muscle surgery. So we should target the primary position by our horizontal muscle surgery. That also has to be added on. Unless there is a pure V pattern, then we will only do the oblique muscle surgery. But if there is a V ESO, we have to add a medial lectus recession. If there yes. is a V EXO, we will have to add a lateral lectus recession along with. Uh, so these are certain points which I would like to say. Regarding the uh, other horizontal schools like URIST school, which mentioned that the medial recti are, if you only weaken the medial recti, what will happen? So in URIST school, as I think many of the PGs would uh, recall, it's mentioned that the medial recti overaction causes a V ESO and the lateral lectus overaction causes an 
V exo. So the overactions cause a V, and later lectures overaction will cause a V exo, and the medial lectures overaction will cause a V eso. So he had advocated that if you have a V exo, you do a lateral lectus weakening, bilateral lectus weakening. Of course, here now we have uh, added on that whenever there is an oblique overaction, we will have to add the oblique muscle weakening also. So that is something which you have to uh, think. And uh, another point I would like to say is that in cases in which you have done, let's say, a bimedial recession for an infantile esotropia, whom you had missed a slight A pattern, you would develop a uh, uh, worsening of the A pattern and also have maybe a superoblique overaction, which will also worsen. So uh, be careful about this. So whenever you have a slight A or a V pattern, which you have missed and you have not done anything about it, and let's say for a V ESO, you have done a, uh, the medial rectus recession, it's fine. But if it was an A ESO, slight A ESO, and you've done a medial rectus recession for the esotropia, you would worsen the A pattern, though the primary position will get corrected. So these schools are still valid. What I mean to say is that they do mention the concept which are still valid, but yes, we see that most of the cases are explained by the oblique muscles when they are overacting, and when they are not overacting, then the dystopic heterotopia of the uh, pulleys by Deemer has given an uh, answer of what we knew empirically that the uh, medial and the lateral lecta have to be shifted vertically to correct the A and B patterns. Dr. Amitava, would you like to add? No, no, no. Uh, Some I, of the I, papers also talk of uh, the insertion of a muscle being at the expected correct place, what we call the correct place, and the posterior belly of the muscle being up or down displaced. And uh, they talk of uh, uh, shifting the bellies, like, like we used to do retroequatorial myopaxy. Uh, they say just the shifting of the posterior part of the belly up or down, that may help correcting the pattern deviation. That is the pulley theory of Deemer. It is the pulley theory, but uh, that, would, that would, we might very soon be adopting some of these procedures as we know and learn and experience more of this. Correct. Dr. Amitabha? Uh, no, I just thought uh, that uh, uh, Amar Pujari just shared uh, uh, this thing today where the, he split the inferior oblique uh, into two heads uh, when he did his, uh, you know, transposition of the inferior oblique. And I thought that was an interesting concept where he's uh, controlling both the torsion and the elevator effect, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, and splitting it. He's apparently got very good results with about his 14 cases that he's brought it up. Just so like I, a split of the superior oblique. Yes, so that's that. an interesting thing that uh, there, there, are, there is more than just uh, the anterior transposition. And so I think people are now splitting that up. See, basically what he's trying to say is just extrapolating the concept that when yeah. you are doing an inferior oblique uh, recession and anterior positioning, if you bunch the inferior oblique, you are going to create not only an anti-elevation, which is there, but also some worsening of the V pattern. So, because when the inferior oblique posterior head comes uh, anteriorly, Absolutely. it will create a more of anti-elevation. So that is the reason when we had published the modified elite and Nankin method in which we are putting the inferior oblique anterior point closer to the inferior rectus uh, insertion, but the posterior point should be put five millimeters minimum away along the lateral border of the inferior rectus. So that is the same concept he is extrapolated by splitting the inferior oblique. Mm. Uh, although I have little reservation on splitting inferior obliques because it's a muscle which is fleshy and it will create bleeding. It will have uh, more of fibrosis also. So we can do without that because the inferior oblique has a wide insertion. We should put the posterior point as far possible, uh, minimum five millimeters. He has mentioned six millimeters, which is almost the same. Yes. If that you, what, you, what, what, you can put the posterior suture five millimeters away on the lateral side of the inferior rectus, you may still uh, have a uh, uh, get away without the anti-elevation effect. Correct. Okay. Uh, so I'll go on to the next question. Uh, Dr. Nidhi here is asking how to suspect in which patient uh, in which we should be suspecting the pattern strabismus. Should we routinely measure the deviations in all cases for all patients? 
I think that's what Dr. Vinita already said that in all cases you should be looking for uh, this. If you don't look for it, you will miss it. You should you should do at least uh, even before you measure the cover test that. Sometimes I find people doing very casually. You must do the cover test in primary gaze in, and in all gazes. Okay. And when you are doing it in all gazes, you will, and doing it carefully, of course, you will definitely get suspicious if there is any over or under action, and then you can further confirm it by measuring. And uh, I, you know, I, I'll say that this is also true for DVD. If you don't, uh, if you're not alert to looking for it, you can often miss it. And then in your post-operative follow-up, you suddenly notice the DVD, which there is a fair chance was existing before uh, you took the patient up for surgery. Correct. So you should observe all, confirm them, uh, but then you have to see whether they are significant or not. So yes. whether inferior oblique overaction is there, it's not significant. V pattern is there, it's not significant. It may be just a physiological V. It may be a pseudo V. Like intermittent divergent squint cases, they uh, fuse better in the down gaze and they open up on the up gaze, even though they do not have a real V pattern. It is just because of the fusion being better in the down gaze. So when you just do a casual up and down panning of the eyes, you may uh, feel that there is a V pattern. But if you measure the deviations in up and the down gazes, you find that it's almost the same. So then you say it's a pseudo V pattern. So I think we need to basically observe in all cases and document our findings and see whether they are significant. Uh, one is the, whether the V patterns are significant or not, whether the oblique overactions are significant or not. Both have to be documented and seen. I always tell that clinical practice it is like the job of Sherlock Holmes. So yeah. careful yeah. observation and documentation is the first step. Explaining, explanation of your observations and diagnosis come later. But यहाँ पर तो effort ये रहता है कि diagnosis पहले पता लग जाए, फिर उसके बाद findings उसमें fit कर दें। तो that should be uh, consciously avoided। जो बच्चे जो इस समय MBBS की बात इस समय हमारे पास सब MS के लोग हैं, that should be consciously avoided। आपको छोटी सी भी finding मिल रही है, even though you do not have explanation for that at that time, you must document it. I think these eye focus lectures, which have been started by Dr. Santosh Shunavar, are for this reason. We need to really update the knowledge of all the PGs all over the country and then probably globally so that we have a uniform understanding of the concepts. Yes. This is a very good initiative. And mm -hmm. we must congratulate Shunavar and the entire team for this. Any other questions, Shefali? Uh, it's a couple more. I'll just uh, quickly go through them. Uh, can you please explain the muscle pulley mechanism in AV pattern strabismus? Okay. You see, these muscle pulleys we have been able to identify, and uh, these are condensations of the tenons capsule, the outer fibers of the muscle, and the surrounding connective tissue. And they kind of form, uh, form an attachment to the orbit and they act like a functional uh, origin. insertion origin. for the muscle. A functional origin for the muscle, right? So if a pulley is display, displacing, displaced down or displaced up, it alters the action of the, the direction of pull of the lateral rectus or the medial rectus. And therefore it makes, gives us a pattern deviation. For example, if the inferior rectus is pulled down, it will... Not inferior, lateral rectus. Lateral rectus. If the lateral rectus is pulled down, then it will give rise to a kind of a pseudo-inferior oblique overaction and a V pattern. So, and these pulleys may, uh, may be having a very large role to play in the pattern deviations. Is there any comments from you, Pradeep sir? Yeah, I think that's what ma'am has said, that pulleys are basically the explanation of what empirically we were seeing earlier, that cases which do not have a, 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 oblique overactions still have a V pattern. So these are now being explained by the pulley uh, dystopia or uh, heterotopia. Uh, so the lateral lectus, if they are shifted down, 
it's causing a V pattern. So we are shifting them up and the medial recti, when they are shifted down, we pull them up to correct it. So basically we are restoring the dystopia of the extraocular muscle pulleys and restructuring the uh, A and V patterns. These are much more relevant for the craniofacial anomalies like cruisins and all in which there may not be a true inferior oblique overaction and they have a uh, displacement. Because of that. So these heterotopic pulleys make a difference in those conditions when there is no real inferior oblique overaction. And the, always remember for the PGs, whenever you have a doubt, look into the fundus for the torsion. If there is an inferior oblique overaction, there would be an extortion. If there is no inferior oblique overaction, just a V pattern, there won't be a extortion. So that is a very simple uh, tip that you should always keep in mind. Yeah. Uh, and the last one for the day is, how do you differentiate between convergence excess esotropia versus V pattern esotropia? Uh, well, I think uh, I would like to um, say, and if the time is short, straight away, that convergence excess isotropia is a near distance disparity. When we measure the deviations at 6 meters distance and 33 centimeters distance, and we find the ESO is more at 33 centimeters vis-a-vis -vis a 6 meter measurement, that is convergence excess isotropia. Whereas a V pattern isotropia is up and down disparity. So it's a different dimension. We are talking of up of about 25 degrees and down of 35 degrees at the same distance, whether it is a, a six meter distance or a 33 centimeter distance, at the same up and down positions describes the V pattern isotropia. Whereas a convergence excess isotropia is going to be seen in the primary position at distance at six meters and a near. So it's a near distance disparity. So I think that should make it very clear. Nam, anything you want to add? No, I think uh, we have uh, covered uh, quite a bit. And uh, the final, uh, uh, we have also highlighted the clinical evaluation part. And Pradeep has very nicely said that whenever you are getting patterns and you are not getting a clear cut oblique overaction or under action, it may be a pseudo over under or under action, but you must always look for the intorsions and extorsions, right? And uh, also that this point, I think I did say, but in a very passing way during my talk, that is a very relevant point that the oblique muscle surgeries do not take care of the horizontal deviation. That has to be corrected in addition to the oblique muscles recessions or partial tenotomy, whatever we do. Yeah. So I think if we are nearing the end, I would like to thank Dr. Vinita Singh. I would like to thank Dr. Amitava uh, and Dr. Shefali for moderating it so nicely. And once again, Santosh for making it possible. And thank all the uh, live audience at this moment. We would like to thank them for attending it uh, and making the best out of it. And all the best. I would like to thank everybody, the uh, initiators and their team, Santosh Onavar and the iFocus team, the coordinators, Shefali and Rolika has been at it, I think, for the last two days, mm -hmm. and or maybe more, and that the two days were visible to me, and the yeah. active yeah, participation of, by the audience so for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. And Amitava, of course, has always been there with us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank night. you so much, ma'am. Thank you for being there. Good night, everyone. Yeah, Good next, night, uh, everyone. I'll just uh, tell about the next yeah. one. Uh, next, we'll meet on coming Wednesday, that is uh, September 7th. The topic is paralytical strabismus diagnostic tests uh, with case examples by Professor P.K. Pandey. So, see you all. Hope we have a good active participation to make it interesting. Good Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night and take care.